that that's a danger of this sort of approach, I think, this sort of meta contextual player knowledge approach is that while it can oh, be really oh, clever. That's a, that is a great term. That's a great term. Could you could you repeat that? Uh, what did I say? Uh, <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Jim and Chris discuss the unique design of the Resident Evil 7 demo and the implications of the meta contextual player centricity it promotes. Plus, issues with King's Quest, Game Boy History, and the financial struggles of Super Mario Run. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 88 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And uh, Doc's not with us today. He's doing his annual uh, New Year's Day uh, Lord of the Rings marathon. Uh, so it's just me and Jim today. Uh, and of course, we're breaking a little bit from tradition. Normally, our... Uh, our first episode of the new year is a year in review of the prior year, and then we follow that up with another episode with the most anticipated games of this year. But this time around, uh, because Doc's not here, we're going to hold off for a week on doing that. Uh, but we have a pretty cool discussion lined up, I think. Jim, how about you tell us what we're going to be talking about? Um, well, I played an interesting uh, demo only recently, the Resident Evil 7 demo, and um, it got me thinking about nonlinear gameplay and nonlinear narrative and what that kind of means for gaming. And whether it's a good idea or not, and I'm not really sure about that answer either. So I think it'd be interesting to talk about. Cool, cool. Sounds like it'll be a good discussion. But we're going to start us off with some of our usual opening segments, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So uh, y'all might have remembered a few months back, I talked about the first chapter of the new King's Quest uh, series by the Odd Gentleman. Um, the, the actual chapter one, I think, was called A Night to Remember. And the reason I bring it up was because, at the time, um, I actually heaped a lot of praise on the game. It's very different from the original King's Quest series. Have you ever played those that series of adventure games, Chris? Uh, I've not played them, but I've seen enough Let's Plays, I kind of get the gist. I've seen a good chunk of the gameplay. Uh, for the for the new series or for the old series? Uh, both, actually. I saw, both? Um, okay. I saw most of, um, or I saw rather the opening of the first episode, and then I also saw um, a good chunk of the, the original series, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, the reason I, I sort of brought that up is because uh, the new series is actually very different in terms of the way it's played. It's it's not really that point-and-click adventure. It has more modern um, style adventure gameplay in it, mm -hmm. which I think works, actually. Uh, the art style is very nice, pretty, has strong voice acting. Um, the, first, uh, the first chapter had actually a really strong story. It was actually very comedic and fun to play through, and uh, the puzzles were actually quite clever. Then I got uh, went back and I started playing the other chapters as they released, mm -hmm. and I started realizing a trend is it, it felt as though um, they weren't really as focused as they could have been, mm -hmm. um, and I think it might have been possibly fallen victim to a combination of this uh, this push for an episodic model in games, you know, the, the chapter mm -hmm. chapter model, um, coupled with running out of funding or something, or possibly just not even having an idea initially. Um, so a little background on, on the game. Um, essentially, the the odd gentlemen, um, when they got the rights to make the King's Quest, um, this new King's Quest game, and they had planned it out to be this bigger experience, they kind of used the first chapter to get people to purchase the purchase the entire game. Mm -hmm. All the other chapters kind of pre purchase them, mm -hmm. and the first chapter was actually so good that a lot of people, myself included, ended up just going ahead and purchasing the whole thing. Um, at a certain point, they even had the first chapter for free. That happened more recently when they did that. Okay. Um, so now there's been a little bit of pushback uh, from some, even within the community, even fans of the actual series, who have suggested that this is almost like a bait and switch because the quality seemed to um, drop off pretty sharply. Huh. Um, now, I can say I've only played chapters 2, 3, and 4. There is a fifth chapter, and there's also an epilogue which I'm not sure if that's actually interactive or not. Okay. So maybe maybe it ends on a high note. 
But um, chapter two was actually so boring, I didn't finish it. I was actually following a, um, a, a guide because hmm. because it's like really the puzzles were really convoluted. You're like trapped in a cave, hmm. and you have to you have to gather your strength by eating meat every day in the morning, and then you go out. And you can do different things based on how strong you are. Like you can turn a different lever, or you can push this bridge over, and then you have to make everyone survive like the people villagers and stuff hmm. but if you don't do it in the right order and you don't do it like just perfectly right they die and then later people get pissed at you for like having killed them <laughs> and it's like just this weird situation where i'm like how am i supposed to know how to do any of this and it's not fun at all huh. um chapter three and that came out six months after the first chapter um then about four months later in april of this year chapter four uh, chapter three came out which i actually thought was a pretty big improvement it felt more like a self-contained story they all kind of do. Um, it sort of retold the second game in the series, which is essentially um, this fairy tale. Uh, there's a princess in a tower, and you rescue her as you know the king, and it, because you're out looking for a bride. So that, but they, what they did was they kind of changed the story around to make it more modern Disney, I guess is probably the best way I can describe it. There actually are two princesses, and they're not really interested in marrying a guy they just met. But, oops, you're trapped in this tower because there's this um, evil witch who's cast a spell on it, and now you're trapped here, too. Mm -hmm. And she'd kill you, except you trick her into thinking that you're also a princess because her eyesight's really bad. (laughs) So, yeah, so there's a lot. So it's actually kind of funny and fun. And it's not as good as the first chapter, but it's at least interesting. Mm -hmm. But then they started releasing chapters four and the rest of them really quickly in quick succession mm-hmm. uh, within a few months of each other. And I think it seemed like they were burning through their budget. They've, they've since released the rest of the game throughout the year. Mm-hmm. Um, chapter four is the only one that I played through. And after that, and I got to tell you, it was terrible. Mm. The game is, the game is almost nothing but a long series of puzzles. And those puzzles are just, or like practically the same thing. It's sliding sliding boxes to connect uh, lines. It's practically the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it's extremely repetitive. And uh, there's really not much in the way of um, levity. It's not clever at all. Mm-hmm. It feels it keeps feeling like there's different people that are in charge of different chapters. I don't know what's going on. Well, that's but, quite possible. Um, um, like, you know, kind of compare it to another recent episodic series, mm-hmm. Telltale's Batman. I've been hearing that... Um, you know, the first episode is really solid, but then I've, I've been hearing that it kind of starts to go a little bit downhill after that. And we'll see, you know, if maybe episode five ends on a high note. Um, but, you know, I noticed in the opening credits for the first chapter that it said, you know, episode director so-and-so. Yeah. Um, so I do think that they have, um, if not different writing teams for each episode, certainly different directors on different episodes. And that might be what's happening here. Do, do you think, because uh, I noticed something similar with, uh, I believe it was The Walking Dead season two. Mm. Um, Kind of had that where the first episode was really good, first chapter was really good, Mm -hmm. and overall I still enjoyed the experience, but there was a clear drop in quality. Did you kind of experience something similar where it felt like it started really strong and Mm -hmm. then it just didn't feel as focused? I think so. I think what might be happening there um, to some extent, and that's it's kind of a risky run with episodic content, um, is. You know, in in a in any given video game, you know, we don't expect you know longer games to be as strong all the way through necessarily. Um, we kind of understand that you're going to have like you know really interesting opening and then some high points and a really interesting end, but there's going to be like a little bit of a dip along the way. Um, and what tends to happen with episodic content is if they're sort of thinking as the five uh, thinking of the five episodes as being the story, then you're going to have episode one and episode five potentially be like really impactful, but they're going to have some dips in the middle, and sometimes but, those dips happen to be an entire episode. Yeah, but I don't think that that really applies when we're talking about. I mean, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, mm-hmm. but I don't think you can use that concession of oh well, most games have these ups and downs mm-hmm. because most games are presented as a consistent experience like yeah. here's this is a consistent experience and that's it's, that's kind of my point is that yeah. you know the, the the same thing is happening except we happen to be cutting that consistent experience into little bits and rather but than i don't making, think this, but i don't think the same thing is happening is mm-hmm. what i'm saying i mm-hmm. think i think they're presenting these chapters as separate like they're presenting them as here's this episode it's like mm-hmm. a tv series right it, it'd be like it'd be like someone looking at a tv series and going well, the first episode's really good, and the last episode's really good, but all the middle sucks. Oh, but still watch the show. 
Yeah. Nobody would do that, you know? Yeah. And so, I, I think mean, I, I see, I see what you're saying, but like, I, I think, I think we actually are on the nobody same would page. Do that. <laughs> cause I, I think, cause what I'm basically saying is that the problem is that they are presented as separate chunks and separate experiences, but it's not being written that way. If that makes sense. It's not. Oh, I see. Okay. Way. So you're saying like the writing, the, the writing is suffering because they're not focusing enough on each episode being each episode, right. a fully contained, right. You know, because, making each one as, as good as possible. Yeah, and I think I sort of backed into that um, connection. I wasn't really thinking of it before, but that connection to television, because that's what they do in television, mm-hmm. is they, they don't have the same person writing every episode. Right. They have different, or directing every episode. They mm-hmm. have different directors, different writers, but they have like a, a cohesive team, a creative team that still comes up with the general concepts, mm-hmm. but then they have, they, they, they hand it off to different directors and different writers. And, you know, they'll bring people back for different episodes and stuff like that. And sometimes they'll bring in guest directors and guest writers, depending on how, how long the show runs. Mm-hmm. And for a good show, I mean, this, it, it works. Like something like, you know, Breaking Bad, yeah. that I think is one of the best television dramas ever, mm-hmm. um, consistently had excellent episodes. It's not to say every episode was perfect, mm-hmm. but it consistently had excellent episodes, despite having different writers, different directors. Yeah. And so maybe the episodic concept for gaming, either... Maybe either A, it just flat doesn't work, or B, they haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, I do think that we have seen some strong entries, like the first, cha- the fir- very first um, episode of Walking Dead, mm-hmm. like or chapter. Where I'm, I'm throwing season. around the word chapter and episode season. Thank yeah. you. Uh, the very first season of Walking Dead, and then probably The Wolf Among Us are the two that I think did the strongest job of, mm-hmm. um, to me, making me believe in this episodic content. Yeah. I would concept. say Tales from the Borderlands did that for me too. Well, see, I didn't play that one, so I can't really yeah. comment on it. But um, I've played a lot of these sort of games, and this this King's Quest is, is kind of different in the sense that it still has um, a narrative that continues through all of the games, mm-hmm. but it it's, like, connected, but more loosely connected. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's, like, a, a story, like, you're always telling stories to your granddaughter, so there's, like, this other narrative outside of the, the one that you're experiencing that is a lot shorter, but it's actually directly continuous between all the games mm. so, so it's a little different and then plus the gameplay is very different between which i think is the thing that really messes it up for me yeah and right the, mm-hmm. is the gameplay is so different like one like chapter four for example was almost all like i said just these little puzzle quests like sliding boxes and stuff and it felt almost like i was playing i don't even know like a like a bad professor layton or something yeah. and then but <laughs> not even three, a bad zelda just bad bad professor layton yeah, yeah, not a, no, not not at all, Zelda. And then, um, but like chapter three felt a lot closer to chapter one in the sense that it just felt like, you know, this is a um, funny kind of experience where you sort of use inventory items to solve um, puzzles, but mm-hmm. it's mostly just a, like narrative driven. Mm-hmm. And then chapter two, I don't know what the hell they were trying to do with that. It was just mm-hmm. like explore this dungeon and trial and error was what it felt like. It was just so they all kind of have this weird like almost the design itself is done by different people. Hmm. Um, and you but, know, I, but I, think, I do notice this trend. I think of, that's sorry. one of those things that sounds like it might be good on paper. Like, right. cause we were describing to me, for example, the episode two thing with like, you have to, you know, eat to get energy for the day and then try some things and then maybe restart it the next day. It sounds like that could be interesting if it was done well, but it sounds like it wasn't done super well. Um, it almost sounds it, like what they're trying to do is I mean, rather than why. like with telltale having the episodic model where it's, um, just episodes, almost like a TV show, as we keep going mm-hmm. back to episodes of a TV show in the season. It almost sounds like um, King's Quest is trying to be uh, like a totally different experience with each episode. Like we, this time, we're going to give you like this little chunk of this game that we thought would be kind of cool in this setting, and then the next time we're going to try something different. And the next time we're going to try something different, so you get like this whole mix of experiences without it being like. If it was all contained in one single game without chapters, it might be a little bit weird because you'd be focusing on one mechanic or style of play, Mm. mastering it, and then moving on to something else, but never revisiting the old style, if that makes sense. Yeah, I see what you're saying, and maybe that's what they were going for. Honestly, I think, to me at least, especially with Chapter 4, it felt like they were just out of ideas, is what it felt like. And Mm. so they just kept repeating the same same thing over and over again. Um, I think part of it, too, to me, it just feels like... um, they're so different. It's not, it's not even like walking dead where, or, or the other telltale games where it still feels like one f- complete story. Like they're still all one thing. This mm-hmm. feels like, even though they're all, there are connections between them. Like I could very easily say, 
only play chapter three. I mean, I wouldn't say that because I think chapter one is the best, but mm-hmm. I didn't want to pick one because it's the first one. I wanted to pick one in the middle. Sure. Um, and I could say that, and you could play nothing but chapter three, and even though there would be a, a little bit of like callbacks and like mm-hmm. the storytelling parts before he actually gets into the story, other than that, you could do that, and you would need no prior knowledge, and mm-hmm. it would just be completely fine because they're so self-contained. And it just it's kind of odd that way, um, but it's true, and that's it's almost like they wanted to make five different games, mm-hmm. but they weren't, they didn't really have the budget to do that. So instead they made um, snippets of games and then put them all under one label and tried to, and then like added the, the outside story parts, you know, when he's not telling the story, when he's an old man, mm-hmm. um, they added those to make it feel like it's more connected is almost what it feels like. This is the gaming meta news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So I did have a bit of gaming news I wanted to share. This just came out a couple of days ago. Um, Satoru Okada is a former Nintendo employee. He was actually a manager of their engineering and development division Hmm. um, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And he is uh, a name you may not have heard of, but he actually has been involved in a lot of, um, you know, managing a lot of Nintendo projects that you, I'm sure, have heard of. Um, one of the biggest being he worked directly with uh, Gunpai Yokoi, who is the um, famed designer of things like the Game & Watch, uh, the Game Boy, Metroid, Kid Icarus, various other things for the mm-hmm. company. Um, so he came out with this interview where he kind of, uh, it's actually pretty interesting, he sort of peeled back the layer on a bunch of the uh, decisions in Nintendo at the time. And he was talking about the Game Boy, and usually uh, Yokoi is kind of given pretty much... 100% credit for its creation. Mm-hmm. But according to Okada, the original idea, and let me see if I can get this direct quote here, Yokoi saw the Game Boy as a direct follow-on from the Game & Watch, which meant a rather cheap toy mm-hmm. without any real business model and no long-term ambition. So I don't think this was meant necessarily as an insult to oh, Yokoi, yeah, but no. it was just kind of pointing out this is what he saw the Game Boy essentially as being. And um, on the other hand, Okada actually thought the game or wanted the Game Boy to be more like the Famicom, which mm-hmm. is the, of course, the Japanese name for the um, NES, mm-hmm. the Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, and that's actually, of course, what the Game Boy ended up becoming. Essentially, he says in the interview that he fought with um, Yokoi, not physically, obviously. But they got <laughs> yeah. in a lot of arguments. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> they had like a samurai <laughs> duel in the office, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> No, no, but but they did they did apparently have a lot of uh, heated arguments until eventually Yokoi basically said like threw his hands up and said fine if you want to do it go ahead and do it mm-hmm. and then you take responsibility if it fails and so that was kind of why they went in that direction mm-hmm. and of course the Game Boy ended up being not just a success and ex- like a s- extreme success and it's actually led to Nintendo's dominance helped cement it in the handheld marketplace which they've never actually lost mm. so the game boy and the game boy was very much like the famicom and had lots of great games in their own right that were not just ports or anything like that mm-hmm. um, did you ever play any of the old game and watch systems uh no not the system as a comparison so they were they were basically um lcd games mm-hmm. like liquid this like liquid uh crystal display and uh very simple and they would pretty much be conversions of either Originally arcade games, and then later they had some conversions of um, Nintendo home games. Mm -hmm. So they did things like, um, originally they were just like random stuff like, you know, Octopus Mm -hmm. is one of the bigger ones, or like Fireman. That was that starring Mr. Game & Watch, as you probably know from Smash Bros. Mm -hmm. But um, the other ones were, they started doing, they did a version of the original Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., of course, obviously very big arcade games. They later on did one of um, Legend of Zelda, which actually is one of the most well-known game in the watch. But they're very simplistic games. Mm-hmm. Like, they're very simple. And so I can sort of see what Okada meant by calling them kind of like a cheap toy kind mm-hmm. of thing, as opposed to being, I'm going to create this like full game experience in a handheld device, which right. is what, for example, like Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, one of the most highly regarded Game Boy, if not the most highly regarded Game Boy game. Mm-hmm. And that's the sort of game that you could never do that if with the Game & Watch mentality. You for have sure. to have, you have to be thinking, I, this is basically a NES for home use. Mm-hmm. I mean, for mobile use, rather. And so that was kind of the philosophy. Um, assuming this is true, I don't, I, I don't see why he would lie about it. It's like he's going to get more money for it, because he was mm-hmm. working for the company, he already paid him. But assuming this is true, this kind, this is pretty interesting, because... You know, that kind of makes him responsible um, in a way 
for um, handheld gaming itself because that's mm-hmm. really what the Game Boy became. It was the model for handheld gaming. Mm-hmm. Um, now, is, um, is is Mr. Okada, is he a uh, an engineer, or more of a business person, or a little bit of both? Well, see, back then, um, they would put... It was, it, was, it was both in the sense that they would put their engineers and programmers and, and etc., in those positions, in like design positions and also in managerial positions. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of like he sort of did every, he kind of did both. I see. Uh, let me see if I can pull up his background, but I believe it is um, from what I looked at before. Let's see. At the time, he was the general manager of the Nintendo Research and Engineering Division. Mm-hmm. Specifically, to name specifically what he was doing. Uh, but yeah, originally he came in um, in 1975 as an engineer mm-hmm. working in the R&D 1 department. Gotcha. Under Yokoi. So, yes. Yeah, so, essentially, to answer your question, he was both. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I think, you know, a lot of times when we sort of say that so-and-so was the creator of this thing, we, you know, we, we say that with the understanding that they are kind of like the face of a team. Um, oh, no. Right. And, and so, I don't mean he physically, I don't mean he literally, you know, so- soldered, 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 mm-hmm. soldered, soldered. What's so- the, how do you soldered. pronounce that word? <laughs> <laughs> solder, thank you. Yeah, I don't. I'm not going to say he's actually like you know, soldered all the electronics himself or mm-hmm. anything like that. Or he wrote all the code, the base code for you know the Game Boy, the programming language or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not saying that he did that. I'm saying that he was behind the concept of what the Game Boy was, mm-hmm. which apparent, which is what he is claiming that he did. Mm-hmm. Which also was originally what Yokoi was was credited with. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm pointing that out. It's like I'm, I'm that's all I'm giving him credit for. So mm-hmm. you're right. There was a team that actually did the physical work for it. Mm-hmm. But there has to be that person that says, "Here's the concept. Here's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And well, here's, even, here's the way that we're going to approach it." Mm-hmm. And then, of course, he managed that team to do it. So it's not like he said that and then, you know, stepped back and said, "All right, guys, I'm out of here. Peace." Yeah. You know, I mean, he, even he with, even with the even the with team, the conceptual so. side, though, I mean, like, there's, <laughs> there's usually a team that's kind of they work together and they work through these different ideas, like you know, these two guys did with. Um, they had their arguments over what it should be, and then they yeah, those came two were the team exactly. Yeah, yes. they were like um, the design team. And so I wonder if maybe um, you know Mr. Yokoi getting the kind of like the the credit is in a sense because he was the head of the department, and mm-hmm. um, because they did decide to go that direction, they he still had to sign off on going that direction. Yeah. Um, and that's a good point. You know, once they decided on that, play, I'm sure he played a very large role in making sure that it actually worked the way that they wanted it to go um but yeah no that is interesting it's interesting to kind of hear that um at first he uh wasn't thinking of the game boy in this way and then maybe you know after they decided to go that direction then you know he played a big role in making sure that it would work um as a you know console like experience on a handheld good stuff cool and the other piece of news i, I kind of wanted to discuss while we're spreading some news, is actually about Super Mario Run, a game that I know you've been playing. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of people have actually been playing it. Um, I think it's been downloaded, what, 45 million times? Let me see if I can get that number again. Does that sound right to you? Uh, I have not actually been following the uh, the meta. I saw, like, one, like, retweet by someone talking about how the Nintendo stock was going down with Super Mario Run. Um, yeah, and that's kind of what I was going to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a this is a little bit older, but it does say that it's been um, downloaded about fifty million times in the first week. Of those fifty million, uh, one million actually bought the title. Gotcha. So that's kind of where I wanted to go with this, and then it's leading from that, and also I'm sure contributing a contributing factor was that report mm-hmm. uh, that Nintendo stock did dip about five points. Um, in reaction to that. Mm-hmm. So that news, um, I, I, I kind of wanted to just talk about why that might be because I played, I played it some, I don't have an iPhone. It's, it's not on Android yet, but it is going to be soon. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I have played it now. Um, my sister loves it by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but yeah, so I've, I've played it too. It seems actually pretty fun. Yeah. Um, $10 is not much. And no. yet yeah. there's this, barrier in the mobile space where someone sees what it's ten dollars this should be free Mm -hmm. or this should be like a nickel or it's very this very weird disconnect that Mm -hmm. with this the younger generation and the mobile gamers i should say um don't really think of gaming like you know maybe you and i do Mm -hmm. what do you think about that yeah I, i think there's definitely something to that and first of all i just want to comment on how i think it's funny that 
the lack of success for this game has caused the stock to dip a little bit. I, I'm sure that's not going to hurt them in any substantial way. Right. But it's like, you know, mobile gaming is not the core of Nintendo's business. I think probably what that's representing is some people who maybe bought into Nintendo after they shared their mobile strategy moving forward. And then they're seeing like, oh, well, if Mario's not doing well, then, you know, what else will? And, you know, whatever. But uh, so I, I guess I can kind of see it, but I don't, I don't think it's anything to panic over by any means. Um, but to get back to your question, um, yeah, I think that we've definitely, mobile gaming has sort of conditioned people to be into the freemium model of um, play for free until um, if you really do care to like buy more energy to keep going or to buy more items to like basically get you through the game quicker or better or whatever, um, then you pay a little bit of money for that. And, but in, um, and part of that model too, it's like people will end up spending more than ten dollars oh, yeah. a lot of the time. That's the ironic thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think it, I think it is a psychological thing. I think that even people who realize that that's the case, they can kind of justify it by saying to themselves that like, well, what I'm spending right now is a dollar, and like next week I'll spend a dollar, and I'm like spending say a dollar a week over the course of ten weeks. It feels like you're spending less on this game than you are if you just buy the game once. Um, because it's taking a smaller bite out of your wallet in any given time. Um, yeah, I can I can sort of see that. To me, when it just feels it feels very shady. Mm-hmm. Like it feels almost like um, sort of like the like gambling. Co- kind yeah. of. <laughs> like a lot of these games almost feel like gamb. Like they're they're very much set up. Um, you know, colors and oh, look at all these points and scores that you're getting. Oh, do you want to do a little bit better? Here, get, give me a dollar. Here's oh, yeah. another dollar. Do a little no, bit there's, better. It, there's definitely it, something to be said for that. Yeah. And, and it almost feels like, and that's why, I, and I said this before on the podcast, it's why I don't really think, I think that you, there's this clear divide between um, the vast majority of mobile games and then other games, mm-hmm. like PC and console games. Mm-hmm. Like there's this really big divide for me, where mobile games are essentially what the old Facebook games used to be, like yeah. Farmville, mm-hmm. where, okay, sure, they're games, but, I mean, kind of. like mm-hmm. it's They're not the same sort of game. I don't even mean from the sense of, you know, the amount of content. I literally mean what you're doing is different. Like it's just, it's not the same thing. And it doesn't also doesn't appeal to the same people, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, my mom might play something like Candy Crush. I don't want to play Candy Crush. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, I have no interest in it, but she's not going to play Mario Kart unless she's sitting there playing it directly with me. She doesn't really have a big, like, I'm going to, I want to go play Mario Kart. She'll, she'll pick it up and play it if, like, a bunch of people are playing it around her as a social thing, but just mm-hmm. not really her, her deal. So it's, it, it's appealing to different, different demographics, too. Yeah. Um, so do you think that in terms of the sales for Super Mario Run, do you think that it had anything to do with the game's quality, or do you think it's all just price? I think it's price, honestly. Um, and I could, I could even see, and it's funny because as soon as you get into the mobile space, um, if you, if you looked at Super Mario Run and compared it to say some other indie games that are out there that you can get for 10 bucks, um, I think it's just as good, if not better than a lot of those $10 indie games, say on PC or something like that or on a console. Mm -hmm. Um, now when I saw the amount of content as far as like number of levels, and I think I mentioned this on the mobile minute last episode, mm-hmm. um, that at first I was like, uh, I'm not sure if that many levels is worth you know, 10 bucks. But when I consider like the number of levels in that versus the number of levels in the $50 game, it's like, you know what? That's kind of proportional. Um, so I don't, I don't, I like having played it. I definitely don't feel gypped at all. Um, I'm also realizing that, like, I thought that maybe it was going to be, like, $10 plus possibly microtransactions because there were a few things, um, namely the Toad Rally in particular, where you have to have these um, Toad Rally tickets in order to um, uh, play this mode, um, which is one of the primary ways that you build up your kingdom. That's kind of like the sense of progression you have after you've sort of cleared um, all the levels. Mm-hmm. Um there, there's no way that I'm aware of to do an in-app purchase to get more of those. You only do it through in-game stuff. Um, and so they really do intend it to be like you just buy this game and then the game can just go on for a while. Um, That's and really so it, refreshing too to yeah, hear that. It, it, has, it has some mobilisms <laughs> in that sense because the way they designed the Toad Rally and stuff like that, like I, I, I really did think that like this was, oh, this is clearly set up to be like the mobile model. I honestly think that it was more of them trying to speak the language of mobile games uh, in their own way without making it into a microtransaction model. Um, which is interesting, that you, you kind of feel like you have to do that um, to be relatable to mobile gamers. <laughs> um, 
without even like charging them for it. So um, it, it's kind of it, I, I'm not enough of a mobile gamer to really say um, like for myself like how I'd react to that. Um, it, this is more like outside looking in, and so maybe like an actual mobile gamer would kind of say like, oh yeah, no, this is nothing like what I'm used to. Um, and I've not played a ton of them, but like my very limited experience with mobile games is kind of like. I don't know. It, it feels like you, you you're, can say it. You're, you're you being, can say they suck. You can say <laughs> you're, it. You're being um, <laughs> you're, you're being nickel and dimed. You know, it's like either you have to be content with a very like limiting gameplay experience that you play in like little bite sized chunks every now and then, um, or you have to be willing to pay the money. And it, it feels like you're being cheated. You know, mm -hmm. um, and it's not as someone who is not used to that it's not a pleasant feeling now if someone if that's like the only way of gaming they know you know then maybe they it just doesn't phase them that same way yeah it just it to me it just feels a lot like a slot machine like mm -hmm. you're just you're going to get a little bit of entertainment for that one coin and then if you want more you got to put another coin in mm -hmm. and you get a little more entertainment and it's just i i don't i don't really get that for entertainment it's not really it. even that good <laughs> right exactly yeah. so i don't know why you would even want to bother i understand that it's the there is a convenience level too because you always have your phone with you mm -hmm. and it's small and you're carrying it everywhere and you need to you're, you want to kill time between between say you're waiting on a bus you know at a bus stop or something like that or waiting in a dentist office mm -hmm. so i understand that concept i just it just feels like we need better experiences and here at nintendo provides a better experience and while it had a lot of people download it, a lot of them decided, uh, ten dollars, mm -hmm. ten dollars, and they just didn't buy it. And yeah, so yeah. it is ten dollars. I mean, am I am, am I sit, sitting over here like on my high my high elitist horse, scoffing at ten dollars, mm -hmm. or is that is that am, am I justified to do so to say it's only I think, ten dollars, guys? I think for me personally, <laughs> if it was like five bucks, I think that would be a more attractive price for more people. I think there's something about it being 10 that like kind of crosses this line. Uh, even but, but five like, might be a lot for some people. I think it was like up to $3 is kind of like people are willing to spend like that amount of money, just like have the game and not have to pay anything else. Like, you know, the premium versions of a game that's say ad supported. Um, but let me, that's like a oh, dollar to $3 there about. I mean, let me ask you this though. So, um, have you had, have you gone out, had lunch today? Um, yes, because it was new year's and my parents bought Cool. And where'd you, you guys went to a restaurant? Yeah, we uh, got takeout from Payway. Okay. So the, what is the average uh, meal cost? At about $10, About $10 per bucks? person. Yeah. Yeah. And you ate that meal and that meal lasted you how long? About 20 minutes? Yeah. 10 ish, give or take. Yeah. Yeah. So how long have you, how many minutes do you think you've spent playing Super Mario Run? More than 10 minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't have so to burn it kinda, off either. You kind of see where I'm going. You kind of see where I'm going with this. Yeah. That yeah. concept of, and the same thing with the movie ticket. How much are movie tickets nowadays? About $10. Mm. And you're probably going to pay more because you're probably going to buy popcorn when you're mm -hmm. there or something too, or maybe or, a drink. And depending on where so you're, you're going, like Cinemark, for example, there's a Cinemark right by our apartment. And so um, I go there every now and then, um, and that's like $15 all set, mm -hmm. uh, not including uh, drinks and whatnot um, and that movie lasts two and a half three hours yeah so i'm i'm i'm, I'm comparing these them to this different experience mm -hmm. because it just feels like people go well ten dollars that's too much maybe i'd pay five maybe mm -hmm. i'd pay one yeah but then they go out and they'll, they'll buy like a ten dollar meal or they'll go watch a, they'll pay to watch a movie in theaters that lasts mm -hmm. like two hours four dollar coffee uh yeah. right four, or oh god don't get me started on the the <laughs> overprice of uh say starbucks coffee yeah um and, so, and i think that i think that really does come down to a weird sort of conditioning we have over price points where mm -hmm. um you know we talk about what things cost on mobile um but like you know you sort of like what you're saying like we we sort of we don't think much of the ten dollar meal because when it comes to food you know like we sort of know like, okay, food of about this quality or this convenience or this speed tends to be about this much money. Um, and then like you kind of go up and down from there. Um, but I think in, in mobile games that, that scale of like, okay, so we understand it might be a lower quality game, but it's going to be free or like 99 cents. Um, and like a really high quality game, like super Mario run being $10 almost seems like a luxury price compared to the, like free or one dollar games, if that makes sense. In the same way that, like, um, you know, going to get a, a, a lunch for ten dollars seems like a luxury pricing compared to like you know your one dollar dollar menu items from fast food restaurant A. Um, so, even, yeah. I'm telling you, even fast food now, you go and you get like a meal at a fast food place, you're mm -hmm. going to end up spending probably about eight bucks. Yeah, six, seven, eight dollars, depending. Yeah, 
I'm curious to see um, as Nintendo moves forward. One, if like more people start getting into Mario Run, like maybe they they'll have played the demo, so to speak, um, and start to, like we'll start to see more purchases of it. Um, or if like maybe people seeing other people play it, uh, maybe they'll start to do more purchases. I'm curious to see too what the mod will be for uh, Animal Crossing and Fire Emblem on mobile. Um, if those are going to be more microtransaction models, or if those are going to be kind of premium, um, pay once and play sorts of stuff like Super Mario Run is. Well, while we're talking about it, what do you actually think about this concept of Fire Emblem on a mobile platform? I'm curious to see what they do with it. <laughs> um, I I wouldn't necessarily be opposed I, I i it's been a while since i've read anything about it and what i did was very very vague basically it's just saying there will be a fire emblem for mobile <laughs> um but do you remember in um awakening the the dlc levels or like sort of the special side levels where you mm-hmm. can play with the Einar yar yeah. um I'm kind of curious to see if maybe they'll take an approach along those lines where it's more about like collecting heroes almost like cards and so they maybe they'll like sort of it's still fire emblem aesthetically and it's still the franchise but it's like maybe a slightly different style of play it's a little bit more like almost uh, a trading card game um not like still strategy based but like you play a card and maybe the mechanics are uh simplified so we're talking about like tens instead of hundreds and that sort of thing um to see if maybe that makes it a little bit more accessible a little bit more quick play um are you talking about like a fire emblem hearthstone crossover not not Hearthstone, but oh. you know so, something. Uh, what's a, what's another good example? Because um, that could be cool, actually. There was like I think there was a Mega Man card game at one point. Like one of the Game Boy Mega Mans uh, was like a turn based strategy thing. No, um, I don't. I don't think so. I can think Kingdom Hearts did. Oh think, for no, game wait, Boy Advance. you're right. There was. It was. It was for um, Game Boy Advance. It mm-hmm. was one of the. It was like. Oh geez, it had some weird name, but yeah, you're right. It was like Metal Man Battle, Mega Man Battle Network, I think. Something like that, yeah. yeah. I think you might be right. Um, and then like uh, there was a Kingdom Hearts for Game Boy Advance that uh, had like kind of a, a different um, battle system that was based on cards and that sort of thing. Well, Metal, Metal Gear did that with the Acid series. Yeah, I don't know if you ever played those. I played a little bit. Um, I really wanted to get more into it. Um, it just so happened that when I sat down with it, I just. I wasn't in the mood, and so I never got quite around to playing it. But I was really intrigued by the idea. Um, I felt the same way. I own, I think I own them both. I don't own at least one of them. So <laughs> I'm definitely, I'm definitely very interested in Fire Emblem for uh, mobile. Um, but actually, I think what I'm looking more forward to, uh, interestingly enough, is Animal Crossing um, because it's kind of a, it's meant to be a play a little bit every day sort of game. And on my 3DS, I have it not on a cartridge, but I actually downloaded it so I could just sort of like pop it on whenever I wanted to. Um, But there's something about, um, because I don't use my 3DS every day anyway, um, having it on my mobile where like, you know, you're sort of already doing daily things, checking your email, um, you know, popping on for like, say on Pokemon Go, you get a daily streak thing going. I practice languages every day get a daily streak thing going so like if i if animal crossing is just part of my sort of like daily um uh, routine I, th- I could see that being really interesting actually cool i guess we'll find out if they alter their strategy based on super mario run or not mm-hmm. and now this week's meaty topic of discussion before we start Talking about the topic specifically, I did want to kind of preface it but with a little bit of information about the Resident Evil 7 demo, because that's kind of where I got the idea. So um, the demo, it came out around Halloween of this year, and I only just now got around to playing it, and it's actually pretty good. It actually hmm. got me excited for the game. It's I don't know if you're a Resident Evil fan, but um, it's very different from the rest of... like it, You're not playing as... Um, you know, Leon or Chris or, you know, any any of the typical Resident Evil characters. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, or, you know, Jill or any of those people, instead, you're a completely new character, or at least I think you are. It's all in first person. And um, you're certainly not as, uh, how do I put this, um, adept, I mm-hmm. guess I could say. You're not as, as talented as talented. any of the other Resident Evil people. Um, so... Instead, you're just you're basically just you know a dude, mm-hmm. essentially like you're just some some you know some schmuck, and you're a cameraman um, on this um, reality show where they're looking kind of like ghost hunters type deal, hmm. and they go into this house 
And, um, of course you get attacked and tied up and then someone, you know, cuts your bonds and you kind of are knocked out and then you wake up in the house. Mm -hmm. And so now your objective is to get out of the house. Oh, you know um, what? I think I saw, um, I never played the demo, but I saw, um, John Tron actually did a thing where I think it was like a Resident Evil 7 demo on VR. I think it was like mm -hmm. a PlayStation experience thing. Yes, you can play it on VR. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they were demoing that. And actually, I'm, I'm curious, um, to what extent that's actually reflective of what Resident Evil 7 is actually going to be, or if it's kind of one of those weird cases where the demo is almost more of like an atmosphere piece, a concept piece to kind of maybe set a certain tone or something like that. Because it's definitely, like you said, it's a very big departure from other Resident Evil games. Um, yeah, and to, to I've not be honest, played a I ton, but it's totally different. Yeah, I kind of hope that it is a new thing and mm -hmm. because I liked the trailer. I, I mean, I liked the demo, rather. Mm -hmm. And uh, specifically for this reason where... So, at a certain point, you can find a videotape. And from what I hear, there there actually are multiple tapes... There could be multiple tapes. This is the speculation in the actual real game, mm -hmm. uh, the full game. But the idea is that when you find a bit, when you find this videotape in the in the um, demo, you can put it into a VCR and play it. And when you play it, instead of just watching a cutscene, you're now in the video. Like mm -hmm. you're, because you recorded the video yourself. You're the cameraman, so now you're in control. Um, you're kind of reliving your experience, but you're mm -hmm. reliving it in the way you want to relive it. Interesting. Kind of and in doing so, you can change you can change uh, certain things in the house. Like um, I found a key and I could, I could use that key or I'm sorry, a lock pick. And I could use that lock pick to um, pick the lock on a drawer. And that lock pick isn't there in, you know, modern time. It's only there in the past of that video. Mm -hmm. And there's little things that you can do and hopefully more things that you can do. I saw them discovered everything in the demo. Um, I got the bad ending, by the way. <laughs> but uh, and I also got killed. And that's the other thing I wanted to talk about was the ending. This is where the, kind of that this concept, this non-linear linear gameplay concept, comes from. Um, after I beat the game, so rewind a little bit. At the very end of that um, video that I talked about, one of the people that you're with, that is you know on this reality show, he finds under the fireplace there's this little lever, like hidden latch, that he pulls down and it opens this this hidden panel. So I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And that was near where the video ends. And so once the video ends, you know, I'm back in the room and I'm, I'm in that same room where that panel was. So, of course, I can go over there and I can pull the, down the latch and I can go into the panel and I find, you know, I find a key and the key lets me try to get out of the, get, escape the house. But of course, I, I don't get to, I get attacked before I do, you know, and that ends my playthrough. Mm -hmm. So I decide I'm going to, I'm going to try it again. But this time, ha ha, I'm going to trick you game. I already know where the hatch is. Right, mm -hmm. so I go over there and I pull, and I instead of just what some games might do is say, no, you can't do it in that order. Mm -hmm. We're not going to let you find it until you watch the video. No, it lets you pull the latch. But what I thought was interesting is once you go into the um, that hidden room, now the key is not there. Mm -hmm. Instead, there's a, there's a fuse there, and you can use the fuse to power up the fuse box that I never could figure out how to power up before mm -hmm. in my first playthrough. So now I had opened up a completely different section of the house by doing things out of order. Interesting. But I would only have been able to know that that latch was there. Like, you were not going to find it. In fact, because one, they don't even tell you how to crouch. And two, it's very dark, and you have this flashlight that gives you very little uh, field of vision. Mm -hmm. So the chances of someone actually finding that latch without watching the tape is minimal. Hmm. Um, and I've actually watched a couple friends play through it as well and diff on different occasions, and they've never found it in the first try either. Hmm. So it's it's... It's, it's an interesting sort of mechanic where um, if they can actually do this in, in the full game, um, I like this idea of you can play through the game multiple times or you can do it in um, a different order and it changes the way that, this, that not just the story is presented, but it changes how you approach puzzles. Mm -hmm. Because like, you know, the puzzle of how do I break the lock on this? Well, if I went this way, I could have these bolt cutters and then I could do this. But oh, if I go this other way and I start getting this other piece of the house... Well, now those bolt cutters aren't there anymore. Now I have to find another way to pick it. Oh, I can find this lock pick and I can pick the lock. So mm. it's kind of interesting that you can approach puzzles in different ways. Yeah, it definitely sounds like they're, they're, they're definitely messing around with like player knowledge, mm. um, which is, of course, the thing that like we might have touched on at some point on the podcast before. But, you know, it's it's not something that's like 
it, it's pretty obvious to most people if you actually stop to think about it mm-hmm. that when we play through games if you've ever seen someone else play it or you've played it yourself before you go into it and like the whole experience is different because you're not trying to figure things out you just know what to do and where to go and how to do it um do you happen to know um if it's possible to get the good ending on the first time through if you don't die I don't know, to be honest with you. Because I'm kind of curious. In, in fact, I've never gotten the good ending. Mm. So <laughs> I've gotten different endings. I've gotten like an infected ending. I've gotten, you know, like they give them different names. Mm-hmm. I've never gotten what I would consider a good ending. I Some people may have. I'm not yet to the point where I'm willing to spoil it for myself to find out. Okay, gotcha. Um, but I have gotten multiple different types of endings from doing things mm-hmm. in different orders and uncovering different parts of the house that I mm-hmm. that I wouldn't have been able to before. Because I'm almost so wondering if endings. maybe this demo, I don't know, again, this is a question of like whether the demo will be like the final game, mm-hmm. but it almost sounds like to me because it's like a small experience, like you said, you can probably finish in about an hour each run through. Yeah. Um, uh, it almost sounds like because it's so short, they kind of designed it specifically to be like, they know you're going to go through it multiple times and therefore they're making the whole experience actually like going through it four times and so you have to go through it four times in order to get to the real ending if that makes sense i don't know if maybe that's what they're going for or i don't think anyone at least from some of the the areas that i was looking because i was trying to get a little bit of of background information i in doing so i found out there actually is a lot of hype behind the game because of this demo so Mm. if it it is just a marketing tool like you were suggesting before Mm -hmm. um it's been successful because it's definitely Mm -hmm. raised a lot of awareness. Um, But people have been talking and and from what I can tell, um, no one's actually been able to escape the house. Probably you can't escape the house is Mm -hmm. my guess. I don't know if that's possible, Um, but who knows? I mean, maybe there is a way to escape the house, but um, I I do think that's kind of interesting that they give you these different potential endings, but none of them are really that good Mm -hmm. (laughs) from what I can tell. Yeah. It it actually reminds me, it reminds me of a couple things. Mm -hmm. Um, First of all, uh, in a certain sense, um, it reminds me of uh, Dark Souls, Demon Souls, um, all those games where they count on you dying basically. And then you use that. So then like basically you learn where this trap is. So the next time you go through, you're able to avoid the trap because you have that prior knowledge. So again, sort of playing with that player knowledge of, um, once you've seen this in the game, then you can react to it. And they, they're kind of accounting for them, the design it sounds like, and sort of working it into the puzzles in this case. Um, but also reminds me a little bit of, um, the Stanley parable. Um, if you ever played that, um, it was an indie game where, First of all, there was a very meta game. It was making a lot of commentary about like the nature of games and um, this whole thing. They called it the parable because, uh, like um, a parable, it's it's kind of this big metaphor. So what it's really about is this character named Stanley and kind of what he's going through in his life experience. But um, it's more talking about like the experience of being a player in a game. Uh, and what they played around with a lot thematically was the the lack of um, like free will and the lack of your ability to sort of like make your own way. You're kind of just doing what the game wants you to do, that sort of thing. Um, a theme, incidentally, is also sort of covered by Bioshock um, right. in, in a different way. Um, but in the Stanley Parable, it's one of those things where you go through the game multiple times and um, you, you learn, like, okay, so what happens if I take a right here instead of a left? Or uh, sometimes even if you do the same thing uh, multiple times, it will change it up on um, the repeat play. So, like, if you've died, I don't know, like, it's been a while since I played, but say just arbitrarily, you've died for a fourth time, suddenly the room you start in is totally different than what it was the first few times. Um, and there's a very particular sequence of doing certain things in a certain order in order to get to a given ending, um, mm-hmm. which it sounds like Resident Evil's doing in a less um, a less satirical way, if that makes sense. Right, right, exactly. So that was meant to be a satire, and that was kind of going to be my point, where it's... Um, and it sounds like Demon Souls, Dark Souls is doing the same thing, and of course Stanley Parable did, too. Mm-hmm. This idea of kind of blurring the line between character knowledge and player knowledge mm-hmm. and relying on in order to beat the game, in order to get farther in the game, I guess I should say, Mm -hmm. um, you need to rely on player knowledge. You have to be able to figure things out that your character would not know how to do, like Mm -hmm. normally wouldn't know how to do. And so in doing so, it kind of, it makes the game interesting and it makes it feel a little bit more like a puzzle, if that makes sense, like a meta, more like a meta puzzle as opposed to, as opposed to you're, you are, 
the avatar, like you, you have, or you're, rather you have an avatar in this game world, mm-hmm. and you're going to react in this game world through that avatar. Instead, mm-hmm. it sort of takes you a little bit outside of the action. And I think, in terms of, because Resident Evil is a horror game, even though this was a first person game, mm-hmm. um, right after that first playthrough, I didn't really experience the same sort of um, tension that I did the first time mm-hmm. because I was already detached. I had this okay, I'm the player in this game now. I'm not the person. Right. right. I'm not the character exploring this house. Mm -hmm. Now I'm trying to game the system. I'm the player. And And so it completely sapped all the horror element out of it for me. Yeah. And that's a danger of this sort of approach, I think. This sort of... um, like meta contextual player knowledge approach Mm. is they want to be really clever. Oh, that is a great term. (laughs) That's a great term. Could Could you repeat that? Uh, what did I say? <laughs> uh, <laughs> meta contextual <meta-contextual> player knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, great. Oh, we gotta we gotta splice that in. It's like what we're going to call this topic. I love yeah, it. there you go. <laughs> sorry. Uh, that's what we'll called the episode. So, yeah. uh, but, so we're not going to retcon the, the opening, um, but that's, that's what we'll <laughs> call the episode. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it, it makes for a really clever puzzle. And if it's, if you're sort of looking at a game and some definitions of game design actually do do this, where a game is ultimately a series of challenges that the player is trying to overcome, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you're trying to learn the system and master the system so that you can clear the challenges. And as soon as you're done, then basically you're done with the game. Um, or if, even if the game keeps going, that point of mastery, if you don't have more to learn, then that's when boredom starts to kick in. That's when the game starts to lose its fun. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, the game could still be fun in this sort of like sense of like, I'm going to get to this ending, say the true ending by playing through the game so many times that I learn everything I need to know and have this meta knowledge and it changes over time so that I can reach that ending. Um, but by then it has definitely lost whatever horror element there was, like you said. Um, so I'm kind of curious if like, you know, games that want to have a particular, um, like the Stanley Parable, it gets away with it because the story thematically and the tone and everything um, is about uh, is about that meta stuff. Um, and so the, it's not like the story is losing any of its heart by this. In fact, it's probably enhanced quite a bit by that. And there's a little bit of a change in tone from kind of like this like sort of happy-go-lucky thing into like kind of this weird uh, psychological deal. Um, but that's kind of like I think what they were going for. Mm-hmm. If Resident Evil is trying to go for horror, um, and like you're like you're suggesting, they kind of lose that very early on by taking this approach. I'm wondering if it's something that, um, as I said, games should avoid if they're trying to go for a particular tone and not a sort of like weird psychological meta uh, thing. Yeah, no, I think. I, and if Doc, if Doc were here, I'm sure he would talk a lot about these different narrative approaches. Um, do you think he might consider Resident Evil 7 or games that sort of take this approach um, possibly crossing into the ergodic narrative territory? Mm. I think he might. I think he might. Um, in the sense that... You see, er- ergodic, I think, is ten- tends to be more defined as, say, in something that's open world and something where... Um, you can kind of like learn about the world as you explore, but you can kind of do it in any order. Um, and also, but it's also like, for example, in a book, Mm -hmm. um, you might flip to different pages Mm -hmm. and things like that. Right. So that's kind of what this is. This is sort of doing. It's you're doing things in different order. You're, you're experiencing the game in a different order based on, on, on knowledge that you experience in like one, one playthrough. And then it builds on it and allows you to change your order and do things a different way. Maybe. You know, I, I'm kind of reminded suddenly. This is this is sort of answering the question while sort of not answering the question. Mm. I'm reminded a little bit of the Machete Order, which I think we've talked about at one point for Star Wars. Um, are you familiar no. with the Machete Order? The Machete Order. Yeah. So basically, um, this guy on this blog um, came up with a way of watching Star Wars um, that he thinks is kind of like the ideal way to watch it, um, and that is to watch Episode Four, oh, and Episode Five. Um, and then to go back, skip episode one, um, watch episodes two and three uh, to basically learn about Anakin's backstory and then also to kind of parallel what Luke's been going through. Um, so that by the time you get to episode six, um, one of the big questions, one of the big tensions that was in six but didn't really feel that like that much of a tension in the original trilogy was whether or not Luke was going to sort of turn into Darth Vader if he was going to sort of follow the same path that his father did. Oh, I felt um, that tension. 
you didn't yell. I mean, it's there, but that apparently the machete order is meant to enhance that feeling. Um, what it also does is it gives you Darth Vader's backstory as Anakin mm-hmm. without spoiling the I'm your father moment. The trick yeah, is, it, though... It, it makes sense. I mean, I, I think mm-hmm. we did talk about that. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I, my preferred order would be not to watch the prequels at all, but mm-hmm. <laughs> it is interesting. Yeah. Um, but the, the interesting thing about it is, like, the, obviously the person who came up with this order had seen all the movies, basically, in um, re- order of release. Of course. Um, and probably, probably at one point or another... Too probably watched them just episodes one through six in order chronologically um but you know i th- i think he might have designed it originally to show it to someone who's seeing star wars for the first time so like here's kind of the ideal star wars viewing experience for you the first timer if you're wanting to like really get the most punch out of it um but of course for that person watching the first time you know that order is the only order they experienced it in um and so i don't know if this is necessarily ergodic but you know obviously the order in which you see things in your personal context, the cultural context surrounding it, um, how much you've been exposed to people reacting to star Wars versus how much you've been exposed to star Wars personally, um, is going to affect your perception of the the series. Um, so someone who is, um, you know, to kind of go back to your book example of like, say you, for instance, someone's read through a book and tells you read the book, um, read the chapters in this order. So read chapter five and then chapter two and then chapter 12 and then chapter one, just an example, um, because it does something different than just reading it through an order. Um, now of course, most books aren't designed to be read that way. <laughs> the author right. put them in a particular order for a particular reason. And so that's kind of, um, I don't know if fan edits the right term, but it's basically, um, the audience making something of a work that was not necessarily intended by the work. Um, right. No, and that and that is different for sure. I think in, mm-hmm. in, in the case of something like Resident Evil 7 or like Dark Souls, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. these are intentional. This is intentional by the developer. They want you to learn something on one playthrough or learn something on one life, quote unquote, like you did in Dark Souls. That's kind of what it is here, too. You're learning something in one life. And then the next time you go through the game, you're using that knowledge in it to survive a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. You know, like, um, oh, okay, I tried to kill... I tried to kill this monster uh, in the basement one way. Mm. Oh, I, I died. That didn't work. Okay, I'm not going to do that again. Like, it's that, that kind of concept. That creates a weird dissonance for me, too. Um, because then, in a way, it becomes kind of the player's narrative, if that makes sense. Yes, It's no, the I agree. story of how you, the player, beat this game. Yeah. Um, but when you look at it from the character's perspective, each one of those playthroughs is a single instance of, say this person's life. And so as far as the character is concerned, <laughs> his terrifying they got, life, <laughs> they, they don't, I mean, it only happens once though. That's the thing is like, they get this far and then they die. And then the next time they happen to get this far and then they die. Uh, and then the next time they happen to get this far. And then, and then for the one that it worked somehow, like they just miraculously like managed to survive, but they didn't have the struggle of going through 20 deaths beforehand. Right. Um, you, the player, did that. So, I mean, not that it really matters because they're a fictional character and whatever. Um, but say, for fictional instance, characters that, that have long feelings struggle. Too, Chris. Sorry, what's it? said fictional characters have feelings too, Chris. All right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying they don't. <laughs> but if, say, a theme of the story, a feeling you're trying to create in the story is um, arriving at this point after a very long and desperate struggle. Um, the player might have that, but the character won't. And then, if, for instance, if the game is kind of like emphasizing, like, "Oh man, it was such a long, hard fight," it's like for you know the character. If they, if the character doesn't say something like, "No, it wasn't," it was you know, it just it just happened that way. Um, then you know you're kind of you're kind of losing something there. I think uh, you know a good example of um, having both happen is games like where time travel is involved, for example, or something like in dark souls where dying and being resurrected is actually something that's in the world. And so your character, you know, your, your spirit, so to speak has been through all these lives and deaths. And so like that struggle and that long, that long journey is something that your character actually experienced or in time travel stories of any sort, you've been through this loop, 20 times, but it's your character has also been through this loop 20 times. And so that character is sort of justified in feeling this thing that the player feels. Um, you, you get that. In, uh, the first Bioshock had that too, right? You had little resurrection pods when you died and you would come through them. Yeah. It's the same um, side of idea, right? 
mm-hmm. Borderlands, um, you know, the new U stations, your mm-hmm. consciousness gets transferred to a new body. Um, so there are a lot of things that kind of mess with that uh, idea Prince in of kind Persia, of interesting ways. Actually, I was thinking uh, Sands of Time, mm. oh, where yeah. instead of doing, yeah, it, it, he, he would say, oh, wait a minute, that's not quite how it happened. And then mm-hmm. it would, you'd go back. I don't even mean the time travel element. I mean, mm-hmm. literally, like if you would die, he would say, oh, that didn't, that's not quite how the story happened. And then right. you would just be back a little bit farther because he's mm-hmm. the one telling the tale. So exactly. it kind of takes it from a different perspective, but still. Right. But it's still addressing that what could otherwise be dissonance. And so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm intrigued by this idea of what Resident Evil 7 is doing. Um, but I think it has to be approached in sort of a, a, a self-aware way where it is something kind of like, you know, even if it's not trying to be silly like the Stanley Parable is, mm-hmm. um, it has to be kind of aware of what it's doing. Um, and maybe, maybe who knows, maybe by the time you get to the ending, you realize that like, oh, there is something weird going on where like, you know, your character wakes up from some sort of weird dream or something like that. And they actually had experienced all of that while in this dream state or something like, oh, I don't know. Um, so, so are you saying that you think that this could, I mean, this could essentially completely break or completely shatter your, you know, um, suspension of disbelief. Like you wouldn't really be able to do so. It's just at all. It depends on what the game's going for. Um, if the game is trying to communicate a character story um, with strong thematic elements uh, of a particular type, I think that this risks hurting that um, for the reasons that I've outlined already. Um, I think that if the game is just trying to be um, this meta-contextual you know, player puzzle-solving experience... Um, where it's about getting to the solution in a game that's constantly evolving. I think that's interesting for a player, but I think that um, if you're trying to do something, if and, you know, games don't necessarily need to be narrative in this sense, but if you're trying to have a game narrative um, that's cohesive and not dissonant, um, you need to handle this approach with care. You need to make sure that, like I said, it's kind of self-aware and knows what it's doing. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I have nothing else to say about it. I think that I think we kind of covered all our bases here. Mm. I just, I, I am interested to see where it goes. I think it, this could be a success. I mean, at least it's it, it's raised a lot of awareness for the game, or it could mm. also completely crash and burn and be a failure. Yeah, I'm curious to see. Uh, like, you'll have to report back once you've gotten to the uh, what do you think is a good ending, if it's possible, <laughs> <laughs> and let us know kind of what you think of it then. Because um, I'm I'm I am curious about it and. Uh, you know, like like you said earlier, you know, it sounds it sounds like it feels very different from Resident Evil game. But actually, I'm reminded now that when I first saw it, I was reminded of um, Silent Hill, um, and almost in, in, yeah. in some sense, PT. I, I um, was I was at first too, but then mm-hmm. there are points where you get weapons, mm-hmm. um, and the way the monsters are presented, it does feel a little more Resident Evil once you start oh, okay. to get into those elements of it. Mm-hmm. Um, the way the inventory is managed is definitely Resident Evil. The inventory, the second you start using inventory items was when I went, oh, okay, this is Resident Evil. Okay, like, cool, it just cool. had that exact sort of, like, um, the little, like, uh, grid inventory mm-hmm. system that they do. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. that to me kind of cemented it. But, um, but yeah, it is, it is definitely different from the others, which is not necessarily a bad thing because Resident Evil 6 was a colossal failure. And Resident Evil 5 was also pretty crappy, too. Uh, the last good one was 4. They had a bunch of spinoffs that weren't really that good. Some of, some of them were, okay, were decent, and then they had some remakes. Mm-hmm. Um, and Resident Evil 4 itself, which I, I actually think was probably the best one, and it was actually pretty different from Resident Evil's before it. Yeah. So I don't think it's necessarily bad that this is going to be a departure from mm. um, the series, just as long as it's a well-made game. That's fair. Um, you know, to kind of touch very briefly on, you know, a game that we talked about last week a little bit, Final Fantasy. Mm. Um, each Final Fantasy is a little bit different from the last two. Oh, um, some of them are very different. Yeah. I definitely have no problem with the series trying to uh, mix things up mechanically and thematically um, and change up their presentation while still kind of sticking to, like, the, the few core elements that we know, like, you know, Final Fantasy will always have, like, this magic system and, like you know, these um, deities and stuff like that, you know, even if summons don't work the same, uh, you know, Legend of Zelda always has, like, the same sorts of puzzles and that sort of stuff, even if the gameplay style changes or the story changes. So, um, yeah, it's interesting. So, apparently, I just did a quick uh, search as well. Um, Didn't actually spoil how it's done, but apparently Mm -hmm. there is something called a true ending. Mm -hmm. 
so I guess that's like the best ending you can get is the true ending. Yeah. <laughs> Probably was still not ending. good. I don't think, I don't know if there's going to be a good ending in this sort of game, but, or at least in the <laughs> demo. Yeah. I'll be interested yeah. to hear what that's like. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for episode number 88 of the backward-compatible.com podcast. Our talk on, uh, what was it? Meta contextual, uh, player and i forget exactly but we'll we'll, we'll figure it out we'll uh, we'll write it out it will be famous for having coined this term maybe <laughs> possibly probably not <laughs> uh, anyway i'm chris i'm jim we'll see you next time we want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better if you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.